I don't know if this is on. All right, well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you. My name is Amy Leister, and I am co chair of tonight's event and a member of the uh, Women's Commission. On behalf of the Commission, uh, my fellow co chair, Peg Ruddy, our president, Lori Cadden, and tonight's moderator, I would like to welcome everyone. Commissioner Notoriani, is he still here? Just left. Okay. Our panelists. Uh, fellow Commission members, and all attendees for coming this evening. On behalf of the Health Seminar, which we host each spring, it's really important for us as a Commission to find topics for the community with a goal in mind of having issues that affect the residents of Lackawanna County in real time. I'm proud to have had the opportunity to work alongside the amazing and dedicated women on our Commission to bring you tonight's topic, which is Harassment in the Workplace 2018. Before I turn the program over to Lori, I would like to introduce you to my fellow committee member and co-chair, Peg, who um, I really can't say enough about. She's been a pleasure to work with, and I've enjoyed working with you alongside this process. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Peg to say a few words. Thank you, okay. Thank you Amy. I, too, I found a new friend. I have never met Amy before the commission. and. I want to echo her remarks that I'm very proud to be affiliated with the Lackawanna County Commission for Women and all the wonderful, dedicated, smart, committed women that are on that team. I liked Amy's phrase about real time uh, in 2018. This topic is very relevant to all of us, um, any gender, any age. Uh, we all have workplaces that we want to be safe. And when we start to take a look at workforce harassment, you know, we're really talking about offensive, belittling, or threatening behavior within our workplace to any individual or sometimes groups. And we want to make sure that we know what resources that are available and the panel will help us with that. The Women's Resource Center provides direct service to any person that you might know uh, that's a victim of workplace violence, particularly uh, sexual harassment, which is far too common um, in our culture and our community. And to start tonight off, I invited a colleague of mine, uh, Amy Gephardt, who is the Training and Technical Assistance Director for the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. Uh, Amy travels all over the Commonwealth to educate communities and work with communities to stop this horrific, uh, horrific problem. I also have a fun fact for Amy today when we got to know uh, meet earlier is she's originally from Los Angeles and is a third generation puppeteer and I thought that was wonderful. Um, I don't think I've ever met a puppeteer before. So um, without further discussion, Amy's going to uh, really frame uh, the panel discussion by having some remarks uh, about harassment in the workplace. And I called you Amy because uh, it's not Amy. <laughs> And so did Lori Cadden. <laughs> and I want to introduce Annie, Annie Gephardt, my colleague. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. And I really um, thank the commission for the invitation and PEG and the Women's Resource Center. I am deeply honored to be able to join you all here tonight. Um, a little bit of background, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape is the oldest statewide coalition of rape crisis programs in the United States, founded in 1975. And we partner with a network of rape crisis centers um, that serve all 67 counties of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to bring help, hope, and healing around issues of sexual violence. And our mission is to um, eliminate all forms of sexual violence and advocate for the rights and needs of victims. We also are home here in Pennsylvania at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, which uh, was founded in 2000 with a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that provides some similar services ar around training and technical assistance and information and library resources to the nation, to uh, all 50 states and the US territories as well. Um, and we at Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape and the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, about four years ago, or a little more, long before the Me Too movement, decided that we needed to update our own internal sexual harassment training for our staff at PCAR and the NSVRC. And we looked at what we had available, 
wasn't great. We looked around for what else was out there, wasn't great. And so we started working on an interactive online course um, to address sexual harassment, provide training for our employees to then also share out to our constituents at rape crisis centers and other state coalitions around uh, Pennsylvania and the country. And we started all of that really recognizing that sexual harassment is a serious and widespread problem. And so before Me Too movement, several years ago, there was a national study that found that five out of 10 women and four out of 10 men who were surveyed had experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the past year prior to the survey. That's not a lifetime experience, that was in one year. And another study found that around five out of 10 transgender or gender non-conforming people had been harassed at work. Um, Statistics are sort of all over the place. It can depend on who you ask, how you find them, what industries you survey. Also, it depends a lot on how you ask the question. So rates for women experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace can range in studies from 25 to 85%. Um, so that five out of 10 is sort of a conservative estimate. And we know that many men and transgender people experience some additional barriers to reporting or sharing those experiences. So all of those may actually be under reports. Um, and I know that with the Me Too movement and all of the national media attention over the last year, I think a lot of our conversation tonight will likely be around sexual harassment. But when we talk about harassment, we really want to recognize that all of us have gender, we all have race and ethnic identities, we all have religion and disability status and sexual orientation and age and national origin, we all have all of those identities that we bring with us to work every day. And so all of the different forms of harassment intersect because we know that very often, unfortunately, someone may be targeted both because of their gender and their race or ethnicity, or they may be targeted for harassment because of their sexual orientation and their age. So we really try to have a holistic approach to thinking about um, harassment in the workplace, and ultimately for PCAR and the NSVRC, our focus is around prevention and thinking really about what do we do to prevent harassment from happening in the workplace to start with. Um, and as we've been on this journey, developing our own internal resources over the last few years, in 2016, um, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission released a really detailed comprehensive study about all forms of harassment in the workplace. And one of the things they pointed out in the study, and I don't know if a government document or a government report has ever had a fan club before, but I might start one for this report. I highly recommend if you are interested after tonight's discussion that you check it out, it's amazing. Uh, but they point out several times in their report that we in this country have 30 years of mandatory workplace policy. We have 30 years of litigation. We have 30 years of required workplace training for employees around harassment in the workplace. And still, this is a serious and widespread problem in our workplaces in 2018. So what, what's the secret sauce? What is missing to prevent this from happening in the first place? And all of the best available research indicates that what is missing is a holistic and comprehensive collaborative approach. That we can't just train new employees one time, have them sign that they've read the policy, and then go about our business. A lot of our efforts for the last 30 years have really focused on one end of a spectrum of trying to keep people from getting fired or getting their company sued. So a lot of policy and training has focused on preventing criminal assault or unlawful harassment. And even if policies and trainings were effective in eliminating criminal assault and unlawful harassment, that still leaves a whole lot of room for behavior in workplaces that while technically legal, can be deeply disrespectful and offensive, and that can lead into a culture that tolerates harassment in the workplace. So we really want to shift the focus to creating workplace cultures based on equality, safety, and respect that are the workplaces that we want to work in. Um, and that takes buy-in from leadership. It takes training for all employees about the role that everyone in a workplace plays in setting the culture of that workplace. 
it takes um, rigorous policy, climate assessment, all working together, and it takes a really sustained collaborative <coughs> commitment. So that's my spiel about that. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I'm Laurie Cadden. I'm the president of the Lackawanna County Commission for Women. And I'd like to start by saying thank you so much for taking time out of everybody's busy schedule. I know if it were bright and sunny out there, maybe every chair would be empty here. <laughs> but it's a little rainy and dreary, so we hope uh, we're glad you're here to help us. And I'd like to thank the commission who has been so helpful and so always there to, to, to answer a question, to be part of this organization. And I thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Peg and Amy Leister because I have to tell you that um, the beauty of working with a group of women for the commission or on the commission is that we all have our own ideas, we all have our own thoughts, and in fairness, this uh, health seminar we were doing on uh, for our dear Marianne Laporta, who's sitting right here, one of our commission members, who's the executive director of the uh, Children's Advocacy Center. We were going to bring awareness uh, about child abuse this year, and we were at a very spirited, I must say, uh, meeting. And we all started talking about things that are so topical and, and, and what everybody's talking about. And it was brought up by Peg and by Amy about the possibility of looking at harassment and that it was our duty as a commission and of women, for women, that we bring something to the forefront from our standpoint and talk about not just sexual harassment, but all forms of harassment in the workplace. And that's why we've assembled this wonderful group of people who said yes when we called, which was always a good thing, and to know that we could switch and, and have a beautiful conversation with Marianne and say, we'll do, we're going to look at, can, will, will you, do you mind if we switch this and move it? And that's the beauty of communication, about women working with each other, and about someone who comes up with an idea and says, hey, this is much, it's a little more topical right now, could we do this? And it all worked out beautifully. So I thank Amy and Peg for bringing it to the forefront front and for the commission to agree and Marianne so gracious about moving to next year and um, so we have a lot to be thankful for working for so many with so many women I just want to say other than Mark you see the mo um, the gentleman in the middle uh, attorney Bob Offberg Bob want to say hi to everybody is the you know you're you got you're a very distinguished person today could you imagine why yeah, Look no, around. I, I think I know why. Okay, there you go. But I, what I thought we would do is by Peg default. wanted <laughs> by default. Peg would. Yeah, I felt it was important that Peg introduce Annie, and I called her Amy, which then set the tone because I was thinking of our Amy. And so sorry about that, Annie. Um, and then I'm going to go down the line, and if I could just have you say why it's I asked you to do this and what you bring to this panel discussion so that when we start with the questions, the audience knows the history and why you were asked to be part of this. So first we have, next to Annie, we have uh, Ch Judge Trish Corbett. And th the wonderful distinction about Judge Corbett is, how many years did you say you're on the bench, 21? I'm in my 21st year. Okay, so I was on your committee for you to be elected at Jill Miller's office all those years ago, so it seems like yesterday, but oh my God, Sean was only, like my, my youngest was only three at the time, you know, amazing. But she is the first female Lackawanna County judge, Judge Trish Corbett. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, what I do now is as much relevant to the topic as what brought me here. And, and what brought me here was that I started off in the early 90s doing child abuse prosecution and sexual abuse prosecution. And uh, on both of those topics, um, I have an awful lot to say and a lot to say to women, but I don't want to uh, hog any anything right now. No, so. but I just, just I'm glad that's good. We'll just give you a brief why you're here. So thank you for that. And next up, we have a dear friend of mine, Kim Wylam, who is the managing partner at Baker Tilly. And Kim has works very. Will you explain, Kim? You were asked because you came highly recommended by all three of us sitting in the room that day. So Kim, could you explain a little bit about what you do, please? So yes. So um, Baker Tilly Vantagen is Baker Tilly's human resource consulting practice and as an HR consultant for pretty much most of my life 
Um, I go and help companies actually, you know, write harassment policies, do training. I've actually been hired as a non-biased investigator for harassment claims and, um, and the like. So again, when it touches HR, like most of these claims usually do in the workplace or should, I'm usually involved in that or my client um, is specifically involved in that and sometimes they're looking for some, some help. And um, we are 60 people strong, and we do a lot of HR consulting. We also do employee benefits. I've got my little cheering section here. They came today. <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear all of this stuff. But And I can't believe that Trish is on the bench 21 years, because yeah, that's same. her victory party. I thought it was only like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and my son would have been a baby <laughs> in the crib. My son wasn't even <laughs> thought of at the time. <laughs> I had to get elected in order to have them. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. And next up, we have the uh, managing partner of uh, Uffberg and Associates, appropriately named. His, the gentleman's name is Attorney Bob Uffberg, and he uh, would. He was asked. He's a good friend of mine and a friend of many, and does this. Has been doing this work for a long time. Bob, could you explain to the uh, the audience? Well, you're perfect for this panel. Whoa! I know, well, right? <laughs> uh, we are a uh, we're a management labor and employment firm. Actually, we do very similar work in, in the respect of what Kim just explained. Um, Mary is my partner, Mary Walsh Dempsey, and um, if I can just sort of shift for a second to what's been very interesting since is it five years? I mean, if Kim, if uh, Trish is on the bench 21 six. years, <laughs> six years. So what's really interesting and has been a tremendous benefit to me in, in my thinking is Mary joined us, I was going to say five years ago, she corrected me at six. And Mary came, she comes obviously not only with a point of view that's different in female versus male, but came from the employee side of the work and has a perspective that's been very, very, very good to work with as we've confronted some of these cases that have been dicey, to say the least. And what I said to Dr. and I, Dr. Ada, where is she? Okay. Dr. Ada. <laughs> Dr. Ada, Dr. Ada. Um, who was kind enough to give me some gum, which I'll chew. It's here if anybody wants it. <laughs> um, but what I said is that what amazes me still and I've been doing this a long time, is that the issue is still going on. That's what blows my mind. Um, and it is, it's not going away. And I don't get it. <laughs> I, I don't get it because, I yeah, I know we talked about this just before. I don't. That with all of what everyone either knows, should know, has access to, sees all the time, how does it persist? How does it pervade? But thank you. Mary Walsh Dempsey is a senior uh, litigator, Mary, is that how I could say? Sit mm -hmm. sit sure. Counsels uh, at, with Offberg and Associate, and as Bob said, his partner. Mary's a, a, a good friend of mine. Our sons are best buddies from a long time. So Mary, could you let everybody know your expertise, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, as Bob had said, for 20 years prior to joining Offberg and Associates, I was part of a plaintiff's firm. For those of you who don't know, that meant I brought the lawsuits. So for many of these younger women or older women or men who came to me as victims of sexual harassment, I was really their first person on the ground that they talked to. I was their first shoulder of support. Um, it's very, it's actually a very emotional thing to hear their stories play out and to hear them tell you how many times they were retaliated against for complaining. Uh, for having them tell you that HR did not take their complaints seriously. Not in all circumstances, but in some. Uh, then flip over to Bob's, and now I'm doing more corporate slash management. So I'm trying to assist companies in giving them that viewpoint where these things need to be handled as expeditiously and as seriously and as compassionately as possible, to be quite frank. And while I don't admit this to many people, I have also been the victim of sexual harassment. So I also think I have a very distinct view on that as well. 
Thank you, Mary. And next up, we have Dr. Ada Rios Rivera, who is a uh, social psychologist with Tiffany Griffiths and Associates. Tiffany Griffiths is a psychologist, has, has many offices, Ada, and uh, you came highly recommended by Tiffany. So, first time I'm actually meeting her. Tiffany's a wonderful gal, and she said Ada would be perfect. So, could you introduce and tell everyone why you're perfect I'm far for this from panel? Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Uh, but if if I were to be perfect in any area, it would be because I name the ghost role in the room, in the relationships with my clients in their lives, and the first of which is that there are only three, I think three men now present in the room, and one of them is a cameraman, so <laughs> he has to be here, um, and that's a problem, um, and that's sexism, that right there. Um, it affects both genders, all genders, um, and it's something, my training is primarily in, um, well, I was trained in the medical model, and then because I didn't believe only in pathology, I moved away from that and went into an alternative model, which is a blend of physics and Taoism, indigenous cosmologies, and Jungian psychology. And a lot of my training was in diversity work, um, in conflict resolution, in working with power, rank, and privilege. And part of why this is going on, keeps going on, it is one of the oldest isms, if not the oldest ism in, for human beings. Um, but the nature of power, rank, and privilege is that it's unconscious. So people that aren't suffering don't have to think about it and don't even know Right. that something's happening. So until they are willing to work at becoming aware, it's not going to change. Um, so Thank I you. hope that helps. Thank you. And I'd also like to uh, say before we start is that um, two women who have come before me in this position as president of this organization are in the house, and two women who I look to for guidance and love and understanding are sitting here and I'd like you to, I'd like to acknowledge them and if we could give them a round of applause because they've done a lot of work. I know what this job is like now, doing this job. It's, a, it's, it's, it's work, it's a labor of love. So we have the immediate past president, Ms. Donna Barbetti. And the immediate, immediate past, Ms. Jamil Zayden in the back of the house here. And of course, my dear friends, Bernie uh, Lepre and Marilyn uh, Vitali Flynn, who have worked the door and continue to work the door and love that job. So thank you for all your help in everything we do. So I want to start by saying that when I made a few phone calls um, to ask people, would you be part of this? Uh, Kim Wylam and I had some very, I think, open, very honest conversation about I'm raising two, well, they're raised, but I, you never stop raising children when they're yours, but I have a 29-year-old and a 24-year-old boys. And Kim has a daughter and a son, and we talked about the importance of raising children in the millennials in, of this day and age, and now all the stuff that's out there and any form of harassment, how do we best parent and let them know the proper way of doing things. And we talked about this, Kim, and one of the questions here is, how do we think this issue is going to affect our next generation? And we see it because these kids are now in, they've graduated, a lot of them from college and in the workplace. And I think it's important to discuss that because what are we showing our children and how do we, we make that change? Because as you spoke about, Annie, change has to happen. Are we responsible and how can we make it happen? So Kim, if you maybe want to talk about that and then we, anyone else can jump in, but I think that's so important going forward. Sure. So. I do a lot of work around the millennial generation because besides harassment, I always have clients that, you know, recruitment and retention is a, is a serious problem in the workforce as well. Um, because this generation is different, you know, we, you know, in our lifetime, we may have three to five jobs and they're, they're targeted at having 17. So again, it's very different. I actually think that there's two things that we have to deal with is, one, I think they kind of help stop this. I think they're part of the solution. And it's, and it's really for two reasons. Um, one, 
they see things through a completely, completely different lens. Um, and as we were talking uh, about, you know, being self-aware again in, in, that, in that unconscious bias, they don't have it. They don't see gender, they don't see race, they don't see ethnicity. They really are the generation that is all men are created equal and that's just how they are. We've raised our daughters that you can be whatever you want to be and they go out and do it. Um, so I think that part of that thinking automatically brings that into the workplace of I don't see, I, I don't see this. I wouldn't treat somebody like that because I wouldn't want somebody to treat me like that. Or I don't feel superior against somebody else. You know, you always have your ones and twosies, but I believe as a generation, they are much more inclusive. Um, and, you know, some of these stories, and I've had conversations with my son and my daughter, they, they can't believe that these things have happened because that would be something they would, they would never do. I think men and women of this generation are much more friends and on equal footing than have been in the preceding generations. The other thing is, is that these are the kids, these are the helicopter kids. These are kids from the age of three or four that their parents and society have told them, you don't let anybody touch you, you don't let anybody talk to you wrong. If you feel uncomfortable, you say something about it. And if you say something about it you, and they don't do anything about it, mommy or daddy are going to swoop in and take care of it. So these kids, they do. I. My daughter is telling on somebody and someone every single day. Um, and that is just what happened. So again, as we look into these cases that have happened historically, or you know, in that Me Too movement, you've got people coming you know, from years ago of all these things that have happened. Um, they were silent. Some were silent for a year or two. Some have been silent there in you know, 30, 40 years, 20 years, they've been silent in a harassment case. And, and the case was horrific and they've kept it to themselves their entire time. This generation keeps nothing to themselves, nothing. If it's not out there on social media, it's definitely in your face. So I think the likelihood, knowing that if I encroach upon somebody's personal space or I harass them or make them feel uncomfortable, that I'm gonna be told upon immediately is gonna possibly prevent me from, from not doing that. Where the generations passed, I think they were definitely, you know, a blind eye and a deaf ear as to how things were going on, or the victims themselves didn't come forward. So, again, this is this is one thing I think that we can't blame millennials for on, or because <laughs> um, I think they will, you know, not only with harassment in the work. Uh, place, but definitely with diversity issues and equality. Again, we hear a lot of things around equal pay for men and women. I, I think this generation helps break down some of those historical um, problems that, that, that we see today. Trish? I, I agree with an awful lot of what you said, and I, uh, I have a different view on some of what you've said, and that is that I think for the millennials that are making it to the workplace, that you're absolutely correct. That uh, they, you know, they, they are the social media generation. They, uh, they know people from all over the country where I knew that I couldn't cross the street at the end of my block because Manuka ended there. And, <laughs> um, you, you know, so they, we were, we were kept in a much smaller, um, place. However, I also see, and I would really be interested in hearing what the doctor has to say about this, I see on a daily basis um, kids that are victims of generational abuse that are <clears throat> just today, a, a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old, and the police officer said, well, I don't really want to charge because really the nine-year-old was the aggressor and penetrated the 13-year-old, and they, there are eight kids in that family. Um, those kids are probably never going to make it to your mm -hmm. workplace. And so it, when we're looking at the kids that get into your workplace, they're, they're kids that have come from better homes and better environments. But this brings me back, and, and I can kind of segue into, we could, yes. we could cover Marianne's yes seminar for next year and then <laughs> we, could just, we could just party for next year, have a party. Um, I prosecuted child, child sexual abuse cases in the 1990s and 
uh, at the time, uh, well, continuing to this day, my th then boss and now again present boss, Mike Brace, used to say that he had to give me child abuse and sex abuse cases because they were the only things I would prosecute with a vengeance. He said, he said everything else he'd give away the store. Oh, the poor bugger! He didn't mean to do it, he, but he was right. And there were there were uh, limits to what I would tolerate. And one of the things that always destroyed me. Um, and I was very successful, knock on wood, on my prosecutions. But one of the things that would destroy me, even after a successful prosecution, was that we put the perpetrator away, and yet that child had to go back into the same environment from which the perpetrator was able to get to them. And that no counseling was done for them, which I used to come back after every trial, and I would hound Judge Barace about this. And a few years later, he, along with Marianne Laporta, created the Child Advocacy Center, which has filled in that gap. But one of the two more points I'd just like to make, and I promise I won't say another no, thing. No, it's fine. Is that I learned back then, I won't, I'll never forget, I went to some seminar once, and there was a picture of Mussolini, um, Hitler, um, Oswald and some other demon. Oh, Manson. And it said, what do these four guys have in common? They were all abused as children. So those are the things that, in my world, I try to identify as early as possible so we can try to intervene. Secondly, the second big thing that I had learned in my career and I think is a fantastic outcome of the Me Too, is that when I would pick a jury in a rape case and also in child abuse cases, who do you think I wanted on the jury? Men. Pardon me? Men. Women. Men. <clears throat> Those that said men are correct. Mm -hmm. Women sexism. were terrible on the jury. They would look at it and say, Internalized sexism. They would say, oh, well, you know, if I were in that situation, I wouldn't have done that. Or, you know, somebody did s something like that to me, and I would never have done that. A guy would look at it and say, I could have been in that situation, and I would never do that. Mm -hmm. And I, that, I always understood it more with rape of a, an older, you know, a, a, an older teenager or an adult. I could never understand it with when a woman would be the holdout on a child abuse case because you just felt that their maternal instinct would kick in. But I don't know what that woman's experience was in life. And the reason I think the Me Too is great and like everything in the world can go a little too far to sort of um, dilute its its effectiveness. But the reason I think it's great is that it is an educational tool for all women to look back and say, you know what? That did happen to me. And that wasn't right. Or, lucky me, I was able to handle it in a, in a way that I could just say, you know, I, I certainly personally had my, I worked in a lot of bars at wait, waiting tables. and. I got to tell you, I never had a, a terrible experience. I just never did. Maybe nobody was ever attracted. But I think. Maybe I, they knew who your father was. Well, that too. And Scranton, Scranton, it may have been that. But, but I mean, out of town. I think it was just. I, I don't know why. But, but I can tell you that I, even then, observed it with other people and was aware that it happened. And I can remember in college, a girl that I really liked telling me at length, and she was a beautiful young girl, one of uh, five girls in this Irish Catholic family that was the black sheep of the family. And we, we got to sit and talk. She told me in depth how the, the family priest um, molested her regularly, and nobody, nobody would believe her. She was, she was the outcast. She was the bad one. The other four sisters were were fine, and her parents who believed that she made it all up. And why? Well, I don't know why. I know that that had to be 
their upbringing, that you know, the priests and the authority figures were the end all and the be all. Um, it has to be a cultural change. I think the millenni millennials are definitely starting to change it culturally, but I think there's a whole group within their group that are forgotten or overlooked um, and would never feel comfortable about coming forward and saying that something happened because they know innately that it was wrong when it happened to them. But now almost, I don't know, it's not a good term, but animalistically, they're repeating what occurred to, with them. And um, nothing better than discussion. I would love to be able to hear from a prosecutor in 10 years that I had a, 12 women on the jury and all 12 voted yeah. to prosecute. That's the message. And I bet Pe Peg is back there nodding her head. You tend to think it's the men that you have to educate. I have always found in my, when I was in, in trial, that um, the men were more respectful of the plight and listened intently. Now we have, a, there are obviously a lot of men that never get it. I mean, the paper today has a, a, an accusation and you look and you say, how could that be now? How could that be? And again, that question for Ada. Yeah, that's complex why that happens, but we don't have Feel freedom. <laughs> well, Speak. I think there's a, a different, there's many levels to that. So some men um, might be feminists, might, you know, understand and empathize and have awareness and, you know, vote guilty. Um, some men might do it from a sexist perspective, not thinking, that, uh, not identifying at all with the one in them that might do the same thing every day at the workplace. Um, and so disavow that part of themselves and project it onto the guy who has been, mm -hmm. who shows up in court and, right, is being, uh, is on trial for it. Um, women um, often will rescue men when they're being called on their stuff. Yep. And that is internalized sexism, right? So they feel our messages take care of them, right? Um, if anything is going on, it's us that did it. We are at fault. So, of course, their enculturation is going to, one, look at the man and see he could never be guilty of anything. And that sometimes isn't even, is so disavowed in them that all they hear is just take care. Take care of him, protect him. Um, and it's the only way that we have learned to be empower ourselves is to empower men, right? To be, you know, catering to them, manipulative, uh, cajoling. These are all the ways, rescuing, nurturing, these are all the ways that women have learned that they will get their needs met, that they'll be safe, they'll be taken care of if they take care of the man. So that's the psychology that happens with internalized sexism. Mary, Bob, any? I do have something briefly. Um, I as well have kids who are 24, 23, and 19. I have one son and two daughters. And I, I agree with a lot of Kim's, what Kim said as well. But I am very concerned about sexting. And I'm not sure the millennials get that at all. No, because I, they're I starting at a very young age uh, sexualizing mostly women to be quite frank with you it's the boys telling the girls send the pictures in the panties or the bikini or the nudes um, and uh, a funny story my daughter's at the shore and I snapchatted her a thing that said send pics and a cartoon came up and I sent the cartoon thinking well that'll be cute she'll see it and send me pics and she said mom stop I go what do you mean she said that means send nudes so snapchat in and of itself has, they're called emojis, has an emoji, a cartoon, where you can send it to somebody, male or female, and it means send me pictures. So that alarms me at that early age that that type of thing is going on because I'm not sure if the boy who's asking a girl for nudes at age 14, when he gets into the workplace, is going to be as respectful as I want him to be, to be quite frank with you. So that, that's one thing that does concern me about millennials, to be quite frank with you. Uh -huh. 
I'm somewhere between I have a lot to say and, and, and not nothing. much to say. This is a, <laughs> this is a pretty august panel. Um, I do want to say, I, I do agree with, I hear what Kim is saying, but I, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm not so convinced. And I know what I see with young people in the workplaces we represent, notwithstanding your fine parentage or your fine parentage, or, I don't see it the same way. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that while, it's, while they are more polished and a little more knowledgeable, it's going to take a lot more acculturation before the thought process really changes. And I think the jury's out on that. And, and one, one more thing, I just, I want you to know I wasn't being disrespectful with, uh, with Judge Corbett. Her father and I were, he was actually my first professional enemy. <laughs> um, and I say that in a very, uh, he actually threatened to throw me out of a window. Yeah. 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 In, in my first arbitration, he's from but, <laughs> but he's one of these guys I got to know and really have a tremendous amount of respect for. He was on the, the labor side of the fence, and we kid about him. We've kidded about him before. Um, I'll stop. I'm so glad you said that. Is it okay if I yes, jump yeah. off that? Because when you said about her father, it's probably because her father, but there it is oh. right there. There <laughs> no, it is no, right no. there that the only reason she would deserve respect is because there's a man behind her, a scary man, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad yeah, you yeah, said yeah. that. That's a good use of rank, male rank. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Annie, anything? Um, well, I um, it's interesting agree on a lot of levels. with so much, too, of what has been said um, and want to out myself. I am a millennial, and I'm <laughs> starting to plan my 40th birthday in a couple of years. So millennials, like, some of us are in our late 30s. Um, and I think that my son, who's five, is like Generation Z or the unnamed generation. So yeah, we like, can't keep up. There's next generation <laughs> after mine. And I'm a cusper. I'm like right on the line when, kind of depending on who you ask. I'm either the last year of Gen X or the first year of millennials. Um, and so I think another factor with the next generation is social media. And I have seen that in a big way um, in my time in this movement. I started in anti-sexual violence and domestic violence work as a student activist my first year of college before Facebook was a thing outside of like the Massachusetts Boston schools um, or whatever, some schools. Um, and as a student activist on my college campus, we were working in isolation. We knew that things were not going well with our college administration, with our sexual offense policy on campus, with the way survivors were being treated when they sought services and resources on campus. But we really had no idea that that was happening to so many other students on so many other campuses. And so I think that the national attention that we have seen over the last 15 years since I graduated from college around campus sexual assault is largely owing to social media and the fact that student activists from my campus in Ohio could connect to student activists in California, could connect to student activists in New Jersey, could connect to student activists in Pennsylvania and all share those experiences and find out this isn't just me and this isn't just my school, this is an institutional pro problem that looks really similar in so many different places. And I see that same thing happening with me too. I think social media is a huge piece of that, of knowing this isn't just me. What's happening in my workplace looks eerily similar to what's happening in that person's workplace, in that person's workplace, in that person's workplace, so that we can really see this is a cultural and systemic problem. And I think that that is only going to continue um, as we've seen with so many survivors coming forward and and so many survivors that I've talked to in the last four months who've reached out, again, decades after they'd had their experiences, um, who really were inspired by having that access to other survivors' voices uh, to find their own. Thank you. Um, Mary, we, we had a few questions from Mary uh, 
Dempsey regarding, and part of that was social media. Do you, do you feel that that's made an impact? Both that do you think we covered that then? From I mean, do you? We're looking at it. You're looking at it from social media when the, the sexting and all that from a negative standpoint. And I think you were coming at it from a, a broader way to get people on board. So I guess it can have its good points and its bad points. But it certainly, I think you would all agree, has played a major role where we are today with this with this stuff. Or do you disagree with that? No, I actually agree wholeheartedly. Um, in terms of what Bob and I do, 10 or 15 years ago, if there, a complaint came into us or if someone came into me and said, Mary, I was sexually harassed at work, it was a he said, she said. She would tell me what happened. The gentleman would potentially be deposed at a later date. And really, with rare exception, there was very little evidence. Anymore? <laughs> They're coming into me. I don't have my phone with me. They're bringing me screenshots of Snapchats. They're bringing me emails. They're bringing me texts. They're bringing me Instagram. They're bringing me direct messages. They're bringing me private messages. They're bringing me the evidence is stacked this high anymore when they're coming in on a sexual harassment claim. So undoubtedly, social media has changed that, the evidentiary standpoint right. of these. It's actually helped make the cases stronger, to be quite frank, which I think is a good thing. The, interesting thing is it just keeps continuing you would think people would back oh, off yeah people would understand and you know a, a couple things we'll see is like people will get drunk at night and all of a sudden they start sending these horrible photos or videos and again 15 years ago we didn't have our phones right by our beds right. when you came home with a couple of drinks in you now they do and that's when they're acting inappropriately so for us it's totally changed the game in terms of how we investigate the evidentiary basis for finding against a complainant or against a harasser. Um, and actually, to that extent, it's been helpful, but it's also another avenue to harass. Not unlike kids who get oh, bullied. Absolutely. It used to just be during school hours, they'd say, Mary, you're a freckle face, and I'd go home and say, OK, I am. <laughs> now, again, the phones. They're getting the text. They're getting the Instagrams. They're getting the Facebook, the Snapchat that are torturing them all night, 24-7. So that, to me, is the downside of it as well, social media. Doctor. I'm just thinking about it in terms of how multi-leveled it is because from um, an overall world work perspective and the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, we're, we're on the cusp of a paradigm shift. And so relative to the laws of nature, and everything is nature, right? We're an ecosystem. If there is going to be a paradigm shift, it f first the existing paradigm has to break down. And how does it do that? It goes through an extreme, right? They call it the law of anantodromia in physics, right? So what goes up must come down, but it has to go way down, has to complete itself. So things have to get really bad, oh, I'm sorry, for people to have enough of a reaction to change, to make the change. And the change often comes in the polarized reaction, right? So. I, those of you who have made any kind of change, you know, okay, now I'm going to empower myself. <laughs> and the poor person who comes in front of you next and tries to just ask you a simple question gets everything, right? <laughs> but that's your first step toward empowering yourself. And it's got to be the polarized reaction because they're the parents of balance, right? So sooner or later, you find your way and those parts, two parts talk, dialogue, and figure out the balance. But as a culture, as a society, we dream up these reactions. And so the texting and, and all these things are symptoms of the impending change, right? The thing that ha we have to react against. And so on that line, because you, there's a question from you, and, and it says, what is, what can one, what can I do or someone do, one person? to change harassment in general, not just sexual, but anyway. What, mm -hmm. what is the answer to that? Annie, you started tonight by saying change. I've talked about it a little bit when we went into asking you guys to express yourselves of why you're, you're perfect for this panel. So what is it that you guys think could be one thing that might be able to change? As the, uh, as the token male, <laughs> <laughs> let me say that if I look back very candidly over my own 40 plus years practicing law and doing labor and employment law, but being a human being, being a person living in a community, <clears throat> interacting with people, interacting with clients, 
I look back and I can tell you that 15 years ago, when, when maybe my first, 20 years ago, but my first use of the computer was, was regular, uh, and, and the internet was beginning to be vibrant and people were sending emails, it was not uncommon for men to exchange, and you say, what's, what's the first step? For men to exchange cartoons with each other that today, if I saw those, I would be horrified. A step is recognizing that. Mm -hmm. A step is telling a client, and look, in, in, when you're doing something for a living, you never really want to offend your client or your, right? You, you don't. But there's a time to stand up and to say to someone, don't send me that stuff. I don't want to see that stuff. It's just, why? I, actually, I think it's wrong. And say it. Whether it's racially offensive, whether it's sexually offensive, that's really a first step, at least for, it was for me, and it is for people recognizing what's wrong and what you're actually going to do about it, having some skin in the game, putting yourself at risk. Sure. That's exactly right. The question is how do you get people to change that attitude? And the Uffberg firm uh, may have one of the keys, and that is litigation. So my question to the Uffberg firm is, how successful have the sexual harassment abuse, how successful has that been in the firm? And do and you think that that is going to change corporate attitude? Or the people who run the corporations? It, it already has from my perspective because... Well, that's what, that's, yeah. that's what we're here in, in, in terms of the question. litigation, I would say I do, I do most of it in the firm. And, and as part of any discussion I've had in the last 24 months, the Me Too movement has without a doubt come up. And I've explained to them that in my head, jury mentalities are shifting somewhat. I might be wrong, but I'm guessing they are. Judge, I'm sure you've probably seen that somewhat. Juries are becoming a little bit more progressive and a little bit more understanding of this Me Too movement. So you've been successful at spank spanking some of the corporations? Correct. Now, what Good. you won't see is you won't see that in a courtroom because, unfortunately, what I'll do is I'll say, let's settle this case before it gets to a courtroom. Exactly. But they will have listened. So now we have to get to the media, though. And, but and you can't do that because you have to get in a settlement that's yeah. quiet. Right. But that does, unfortunately, well, logistically I mean, in the I real world, the that's what occurs. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just uh, discussing part of the problem. No, well, and you have to look at all, and again, now to play devil's mm -hmm. advocate, there are a lot of cases that are settled because it's the easier thing for the employer and to cheaper. do and cheaper. <laughs> and whether this is harassment or wrongful termination, you know, we see this is if the claim is brought and there's an it's either from a very vocal person or if there's any inkling um, that it smells like it might go someplace, they're just settling. And it could be a bogus claim. And again, this is where the problem is, is that it's this whole blind eye, deaf ear. I'll just write a check. Nobody will know about it. I just won't say anything. It's these things do need to start coming to the forefront and be vetted appropriately because I also think that a lot of reasons why we have some of these things is, you know, there are victims and then there are victims who say they're victims. Mm -hmm. And the victims who say they're victims are not doing anybody any, any service here. You know, the, the girl who flirts with everyone at work and we just let it go and just call her the flirt, well, Again, what, what's happening there? Not Maybe she is being harassed, maybe she's not being harassed, but what's that culture starting to happen where, again, we're just allowing that behavior to happen because it's not directly happening to me or because that person is willingly participating, we're not calling it harassment. And people are, are, are losing sight of what's, what else is happening in the workplace when they're seeing that going on. But, oh, it's not involving me or that's her business, you know, and we just walk away and, and don't do anything about it. Uh, you know, a lot of my clients, again, and I try to work with clients before the lawyer comes in because, again, it would be more cost effective and culture is a, is a big thing. And there will be many of my clients have multiple departments and there's different cultures depending on different departments, you know. Well, this department doesn't have that. Well, this department, that's just how they are. That's just how they are. Their manager's been here a long time, and that's just how he is. And he's, 
again, this isn't always sexual harassment. It's just harassment in general. Who, you know, who speaks with vulgar words? Who doesn't use vulgar words? You know, it, again, it's it's all of this accepted behavior that is happening because it's either not happening to me or it's I'm not seeing physical harm um, where people are just being silent about it. I would just like to say, taking off on what Bob said, that um, we, in the last two to three years, we lost two Supreme Court justices in Pennsylvania for mm -hmm. passing on messages yeah. of wanting to just be one of the guys. and. Uh, and they, they, they were hard, that was a harsh penalty, but it was a just penalty. And I feel strongly as a judge that we have an obligation uh, to, uh, to act, you know, extremely appropriately at, at all times. However, not too many people know about that. We know about that in the legal community. We know about that in, uh, on the, the judicial branch of government. I'm sure throughout the country they know about that. But then we have kids and people listening every day and believe me, I anybody could tell you I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm presently a Republican, but we have a president that says it's okay. And um, what kind of a message is that that's going out? Not just to the kids, because maybe the kids aren't listening, although they listen more than we think about that. but to young adults, that it, a joke is made of it. Not just the sexual innuendos and the tapes that we know, but the way he talks to people and treats people. And this is our representative throughout the, the entire world that you can, you know, just bully, which is what I see it to be. Whether you, it, you can have an intellectual disagreement with someone else without calling them a nasty name like Freckles over here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that is an issue that I think we are going to have. We have an issue that we're going to have until we don't have it. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're maybe continuing after if that becomes. Or that's right. Yeah. Well, the same so thing. The real, Go ahead. the real. Uh, curse of all of that would be if that changes the course of this country and that becomes the norm because that in my view is just completely despicable even though my father threatened to throw you out the window he, <laughs> you know he never would have and he had the utmost respect for you and, and by the way he was probably right at that time. he probably was <laughs> i'm sure he was bob and After all, he was only he was only representing the poor coal miners, and you were out there for the damn barons. But fair enough. <laughs> yeah, put me in, coach. So <laughs> the litigation solution is a lot like the politically correct solution, right? It drives the real emotional process underground, the personal level, right? where people's stories are, where their wounds and their reactions are. And those never get talked about. So when you drive a, a process underground, nothing's going to change. It's just going to cycle, right? Which is why it never shifts, which is why we then have to dream up characters like Weinstein and Trump, right? Because we are disavowing all that shadow energy ourselves, right? Why don't people know about those two judges? Well, because people aren't talking about them, right? People should be talking about them. There's also the issue as well of rap music. You know, I hear that in my house and I literally turn it off the second I hear it. It is so graphically sexualization of women it's at, and the videos forget if anybody's ever seen the videos they're even worse and um, I'm not just blaming rap but it does seem to be the genre that seems to take on the, the the sexualization of women and again that's what these kids the Millennials so to speak are growing up with and if that's Which what I they're have to just say if they're ruled, hearing that industry is ruled by white men at wait and comedy clubs the, the comedy that you'll it. see on HBO or go to a comedy club it's the same thing and it's funny because I'd made a note. There's a bipolarness to this whole thing. You're saying, and I agree with you, I have four sons. I'd like to think they got it and get it. But you know what? 
on one hand, we're training them, training them properly to, to think of each other, of whoever you're with as a human being, not, as, not in the traditional, typical relationship. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. Turn on, turn on what they're listening to or what they're watching at 11.30 at night on a comedy show, it's like, it's bipolar. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that transfers, I wanna add two quick things. One is, and I think Kim, you made this point and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, there are some people who get trapped in all of this. Absolutely. There are some good, good men Absolutely. who have been falsely accused. We have defended some of those people and we have settled some of those cases because you're 100% right. It's cheaper, it's more facile. There is a big emotional, a big emotional toil, toll to anyone who's ever been involved in one of these actions. And I didn't fully understand what you said, but I understood part of it, and I think I agree with you. If we can talk afterwards, I'll know whether I fully agree with you. I, I agree that there are men who are falsely accused, and I also want to say that that, it seems to be a go-to, like, I, I just want to hear one conversation where that isn't said because for eons, women have been falsely accused of being responsible for their abuse, for the violence that's imposed on them. And just once, I want men to own their rank and power and privilege and not say Admit that. <laughs> not well. say there are good men that are, we know that. We know that. We're not going around accusing good men and if there are women that are doing that, oh, and there are, there and, are. There are. and there are, but we and know that too. Well, right? if, if, thank you. Just I'm have to say sure. that. No, no, no. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm the one who named you. No, no, no. I, I'm sure you're right, but I'm also, I do want to, I do want to state that because I think it's appropriate to do that because that's what we do for a living, and we're working with Absolutely. people in workplaces. <clears throat> the other thing I would add is that workplace training. There's been discussion about workplace training. I, I will tell you very honestly, from my perspective, it is a necessity. Agreed. We do it. We have to do it. If you are, again, representing an employer, not psychoanalyzing the employer and, and all of its people, but representing it, you want to make sure mm -hmm. that all of, all of those people come through training. And now I'm going to tell you that honestly, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's pablum. It's, it's like washing your hands in cold water without soap and expecting not to get sick. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna do it for any workplace. It is, and I've probably said by a number of people, it's a culture change. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. And that starts, you know, you wanna talk about the Trump White House, seriously. And, and it's said all the time on television by commentators on the left and on the right, Take a look at, at where, where stuff is coming from at the top and you're gonna understand where your press secretary is coming from, where this person is coming from, et cetera. You've got to affect the inner circle of a company. You've got to affect your, your chief executive, your chief operating officer. When you affect them, it all, everything flows down. Male fee, it doesn't matter. But I'm saying you have to affect from the top down and then you see a change culturally in an organization. And that includes starting with yourself too. I mean, if we Absolutely. look at Trump, where do I, where am I irrational? Where, when am I stupid? <coughs> when am I racist, sexist, whatever, ignorant, right? So that's where inner diversity work begins is inside. What are the parts of myself I'm not okay with that I don't wanna look at, that I wanna pretend aren't there and I project out? Right, you can't have a conflict out here without first having a conflict in here. And that's where I think, starting off with Kim's statement, she was absolutely right. I think to that extent, this, and I'm, I'm, I may be misnaming the generation, but the kids <laughs> coming up now are more open-minded to what you, as you were saying, they're, they're more open-minded that they don't see color, they don't see, not, not all of them, but I think, a, br a much broader group of them. Um, well, can I say something? Sure. I, I'm sorry. I'm, 
So I think it's easy to say that in the infancy of a new generation, one, because they're busy rebelling against their parents. Right. Well, that's right? true. So I, yeah. a rebellion is the polarized <laughs> reaction, right? It's not necessarily indicative of an informed, examined life and choice, a free choice, right? It's often a reaction against something to establish independence, which is fine. That's a developmental phase. But it's not like we're seeing a mature, individuated person yet, right? And like, I can't remember who made the point. These are also privilege. Anytime someone has a voice, it's privilege, it's power, it's rank. There are many, many kids, people we see that don't have a voice. True, Nina. First of all, I just want to say this has been fabulous. I was not looking forward to coming. It's very <laughs> uncomfortable, seriously, to, to hear and, and you know, and just hear different stories. But um, I was just thinking, like, you know, I work with an architectural firm, so you know, you have to get your continuing ed. And I think, like, why can't the Department of Labor and Industry? And I mean, I have my real estate license. You have to get your training. So, like, why can't the Department of Labor and Industry like have a required if you have a company of ex-employees, you know what I'm saying, like check the box, you had everybody there, you know what I'm saying, like there's lunch and learns continuing it, I don't know if there's anything that's out there, like to educate people. I'm sorry. There, there are. There are. There are, and what, but what I see is that everybody has checked the box, and that's wrong. It's paper compliant. Yeah, that is, so that's right. All new hires go through harassment training. Every if you go and look, you know, deep into these employers of all of these celebrities, they will all have harassment policy, right. um, and they will even have anonymous hotlines. I mean, they'll right. have every bells and whistle imaginable <laughs> um, for people to be able to report claims or for the company to say we don't tolerate this behavior but the behavior still happens and that's the thing it's 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 trying to fix the culture so that what you're saying is happening is what's truly happening because otherwise it's a, it's a total disconnect and i want to say it happens but it happens that way and it's not going to change until people start really looking at these different levels and start owning their own stuff right so I don't see that kind of training out there. I, I, and I well, One other thing I want to add. I, I'm a child of the 70s. I know you find that hard to believe, but, <laughs> but I am. And you know what? In my generation, we thought we brought peace, the peace movement, and, and a lot of good feeling about each other. And, and if I can use the term love, not free love, but love, it was a different it was a very positive, proactive feeling of caring for each other. You know what? <clears throat> I look now at peers who were part of that. And you know, there's that television commercial, I, I don't know whose it is, but it's pretty funny, where the guys and women start talking like their parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Progressive. It's an insurance, yeah, yeah right. OK, whatever it is. But you know, I got to tell you, I see some of the same thing. And because I think it's exactly what you said. It's easy to feel that way, speak that way, have that affect when you're 18 and 19 and 20, and the world is your oyster and you can speak about everything in the purest possible sense, reality sets in. You go out, you make a living, you start, you start doing things, and you may be mimicking your what you saw at home or what you lived with at home and it may not be as good as as all that yeah i mean we do what it's, we were taught or right. the opposite the polarized reaction so i i don't think we ought to pat ourselves on the back quite yet we're not we're a far a far cry from where we need to be right so what happens then and one of the questions will blend it in and we we'll have two more because believe this or not we're it's, we're doing this a long time already. But what I want you to talk about, if we could, because this will go on, is what is what the negative effects that the Me Too movement has brought to business, to companies, to corporations, how, and what is it that companies will now do because of this movement to ensure and to, and to work with its employees going forward so that they can feel safe, as you said earlier, Annie, in their work environment and feel comfortable 
being who they are, or if there is an issue that they can talk to someone. So it's two prong, what are, what, what, what are the negative effects and how are we gonna change that within a, a corporations for the, the welfare of their employees? And I don't care whoever wants to, Kim, do you wanna start? So I certainly see, you know, everybody, it's brought awareness you know, to corporate America tenfold. So everybody's at least looking at their policies and brushing them up and making sure they're current. I see a lot of retraining going on. Um, I also see, again, this implementation of, you know, these um, hotlines where you can report things anonymously. So again, to help at least just open the door for conversation. Um, what what I'm trying to focus on again is all right, not just checking the box with the policies, but again, seeing it, it. How do you change the culture? How do you make sure that the culture is more engaging? Again, helping to consult with with management <coughs> on, on more team building and inclusiveness. Again, it's trying to create a culture that the problem then doesn't rear itself. Um, my fear is is that because of this movement, and again, because we still have a, a, a gender gap within management positions, the numbers, and certainly um, within pay, is that this may deepen that even further. Because I think this unconscious bias may take over where, and, and you know, I hope it's not, um, but uh, my fear is that it, it will, is that men will, you know, retract and start being playing it safe. You know, oh, I'm not going to say anything at all because I don't want to be sued or I don't want to be viewed as that's inappropriate. I was just trying to be friendly, again, and have that type of a reaction that it actually sets us back. So, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, you know being able to have um, change this culture to be a more open and inclusive workforce to be able to talk about things, even subjects that are uncomfortable. Um, so that you can, you know, start to nip it and start to address it in that way so that we don't have a further divide to just make this problem go away or not happen again. You know, I, I can't be accused of harassment if I never talk to a woman in the workplace, you know, and I, or if I never have one report to me, you know, and we, and I travel a lot with my work, you know, it's, it's all of those things that would, you know, I don't want to see happen and, and, and set us back even further in the workplace because we still, you know, we're not where we need to be, um, you know, as a gender in management, in executive management ranks, um, uh, and that's in every single company, you know, big or small across the country. You know, there's there's fewer women CEOs by far, um, and obviously the, the the pay gap, which I'm even seeing now within states starting to enforce. Um, you know, state of New Jersey now looking to make sure that uh, equal pay for equal work is now going to start to not just be words but be enforced and look for audits to happen. So you hate to have to have legislation and the handcuffs be waived for you to start to change. It's, it is an opportunity now for employers to kind of reinvent themselves culturally because it is so important to their, to their strategy if they want to stay around. And thanks, Kim. And Bob and Mary, what do you think on that from a standpoint of, of corporate or business in America moving forward? What, what do you guys see? What do you think needs to be done? Um, I'll address one of the negatives, and Kim touched on it. I think it's a great point. I do a lot of training on this topic, and uh, without exception, a man will come up to me afterwards, and he's nervous. He's afraid. He said, do you mean I can't? hug Mary when she has a baby like if I or if I come in after one of my kids did something he may give me a big hug and say congratulations that doesn't bother me at all in the wrong workplace that could be misinterpreted so it really is starting to gel some of the social relationships between men and women in the workplace and I have found it can be in a somewhat negative way which I think does in, impact employee relations so I don't like that um, in terms of some quick positive things and I know Bob wants to chime in um, obviously, there's been an increase in reporting. <laughs> Mary, his face said it all. Yeah, so I know. So obviously, there's been an increase in reporting, which is amazing. But I think um, the women coming forth uh, have increased reliability. Uh, at least I'm seeing that in the investigations I'm doing. Even if they're decades old, 
Believe it or not, a lot of them didn't know what happened to them was wrong at the time. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, unbelievable. Right. You may run into mm -hmm. this. And it, they really have some credibility associated with them. Um, they're coming forward with more confidence. They understand that the system is there to help them, to assist them. They used to be fearful for losing their job. They used to be fearful for retaliation. They now know that, again, ideally, the system is set up to help them. So that has been some of the positives. Like I said, the negative to me is really just this fear of being too, like coming in and saying, hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Which is a seemingly innocuous question. Right. Until a woman thinks, well, why did he ask me that? Did he want to go on a date with me? Mm -hmm. Didn't he know I had my boyfriend over? Well, this whole subject matter of clothes. It's yeah. like, can you comment on somebody's Mary, you look pretty outfit, today. Right, But you right. can't say you look hot. Right. Well, am I saying the same thing? You know, so, again, it, it, so it's all of there's that. There's some quirks mm -hmm. we have to work on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, one of the things I want to say is when, when someone exaggerates the point of your argument, it's meant to diminish the argument, right? It's meant to act as if, oh, you know, you've just held me hostage. I can't say a word. I'm disempowered now, and I better not say anything. And it's meant to manipulate, right? So, I mean, one of the first things I might say to someone who does that is, well, I'm glad you're having a reaction to yourself. <laughs> it's, this is the fear that women have been feeling for eons. Now you're feeling some of that. That's good. And, you know, if you need some help in figuring out what's okay to say and what's not okay, I'm happy to talk with you about that. Good that you asked the question and great that you're having a reaction. Um, the other thing I want to say is to expect any problem to only just go away mm -hmm. if we put enough time and money and policy and procedure and whatever awareness into it is to say that nature will no longer be nature, mm -hmm. right? It's both beautiful and brutal. We are an ecosystem. There will always be the polarities and the spectrum in between, and it's how we Manage. work with those, how we acknowledge them in ourselves and then work with the outer thing. I say that a little bit more simpler. You can't fix stupid. <laughs> <laughs> stupid is always going to be there. There's always someone who had the best training and the best, the best cultural experience, and, and they're going to do something that's just absolutely <coughs> stupid. And you can't legislate morality. Yeah. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple technical things technical as opposed to the social mental health pieces that were entirely there. By the way, I think your points were incredible. Um, I, I have to figure them out, though. <laughs> I'll help you. I, OK. Um, two, two things. One is that we can't overlook this. One of the concerns that we often have when these things germinate is that there can be more violence. Mm -hmm. And I'm t we're talking about the workplace now. So it's not just dealing with, sometimes it is, but it's not just dealing at times with someone who has done something wrong, harassed someone. That, may, that workplace harassment may have been between two people who are having already having a relationship. Mm -hmm. And when you go to cure that in a legal sense, there is a psychosocial workplace <coughs> thing that goes on that can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And as employer, as employers, as employees, as human beings in a workplace, you've got to watch that and you've got to really, really be careful how you manage that. We have seen violence erupt. We are doing, by the way, no, we're not doing it. We are recommending. And for those of you who live in Scranton, I want to tell you that the Scranton Police Department does an, inc there's a person there who does an incredible job with training on the, Workplace on the active shooter. <coughs> and wherever you work, if you manage these issues yourself or if you have the opportunity to speak to the people who do, whether it's in Scranton and it's active shooter training from the Scranton Police Force, whether it's the state police in another location or your local police in another location, you should do it. It is an incredible thing. 
and God forbid, the the worst thing that could, the worst nightmare any of us could have, is that experience. And I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but we can't ignore these things. These things do happen. So that's, as I said, a somewhat technical point. The other, I'll, I'll let the other point go. <laughs> Patricia, and before we, once, can you, would you, do you want to say anything before we take any audience questions on no, that? No, thank you. Annie? Okay. Rhonda? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much. This is fabulous. Fabulous. Um, <clears throat> I've spent 20 plus years in the construction, architecture, engineering world, which has been very male dominated for many years. We're seeing it change now. Um, and so, two points. Um, one is, I think that the Me Too movement is, is being heard out there. I work for a large construction company right now. Um, we've had diversity training um, in our company uh, that was given by an attorney. Um, so to make um, actions and consequences very, very clear and, and you know where, where those boundaries are in communication and action um, within our company. So it's, I see it happening, I'm, I'm fortunate, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, the other thing is, is earlier in my career working for another company, um, I learned very early on that um, men and women are very different. Yes. And, and coming up, you know, through the 80s and, and, you know, where we wanted as women to go out and do a man's job and to make a man's wage, and we wear our big suits, you know, back, back in the olden days, um, Somewhere along the lines, I've appreciated that um, we are different, and we think different, we process information different, we communicate different. Um, and I remember one time as a young designer going into a, a principal's office and, and very excited about something, and he, sa he said to me, Rhonda, he goes, I just asked you what time it was, not how to build a watch. And, and that, you know what, I mean, for as, as harsh as that was to hear, it was a learning lesson for me because I spent a lot of time reading on the way, the differences that men and women communicate and process information. So I think sometimes we have to take this dialogue down to the first floor. And, to, and for me, navigating this man's world, um, just learning the basics that when I communicate with you know, men in position and power, that I understand a little bit more of kind of how their gears are turning, um, and I kind of, you know, take that into consideration and how I communicate. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just fine. want to say one very quick thing mm -hmm. for anyone who hasn't seen it, go to see RBG, which is the movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We saw it this week. My wife and I saw it this weekend. What you just said is what she said. She argued four out of five extremely successful plaintiff's cases before the Supreme Court on harassment, discrimination. She was, a, I didn't realize how much of a game changer she was, Ju Justice Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. And her point was, think about this, she's a Supreme Court justice now. She said, when I got up to the Supreme Court and had my first argument, and it continued as I continued to have arguments, I realized I, I had to treat these justices who were at that time all male. It was like kindergarten. <laughs> it was training them in the time that I had to make an argument, not on the basis of, an, of equality of understanding, but they didn't have a basic comprehension of what it was to be a, a female and to be in the workplace as a female. It was really an incredible excuse me, an incredible movie, incredible story. It's, about, it's her story. And yeah. I've, I've learned you know, that as women, we also, in our own minds, um, we don't value, we don't allow ourselves to value ourselves. This is your topic. Um, I think as much as men allow themselves to value themselves, but somewhere along the lines, I've learned to ask for that raise. I've learned to say, you know, when asked, is your salary agreeable to you? It's like, well, is it agreeable to you compared to my peers, which you know what their, their numbers are. Mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid to do that today. But 10, 15, 20 years ago, 
I would sit like a church mouse and just, you know, be grateful and, you know, be accommodating and quiet and, you know, so on and so forth. But um, my mother-in-law, I know Judge, you know, her very well, uh, over the years, Diane Beamer, she yes. was one of two um, women in the graduating law school class of 300. And um, I think that this is an ongoing solution or issue that I'm grateful for women, like my mother-in-law, like Judge Corbett, to plow the way for us to come so far where we are today. And we have work. Well, it's actually gone on for thousands of years. Yeah. I thought about that on the way here tonight. And we have, certainly, we have places to go. But boy, have we come a long way in the last hundred years. The last hundred years, we've come further than thousands of years before, before them. So uh, from the time we got the right to vote and, and the women's suffrages, the people that, that did it for us. And that's when, that's when we fail as a society, is when we forget that it is not us. It is not now and what are we going to do to change this. This has been a process from the beginning of time. And, you know, I blame everything on Eve eating the damn apple. If she, if she just didn't eat the apple, our lives would have been entirely different. But, but uh, from the beginning of time. Maybe Adam ate the apple. If Adam ate the apple. He just blamed her. He just blamed her. And he blamed her, right? And she said, all right, I don't, I don't want you to go to jail for me. I'll, I'll take the blame. Yeah, that typical. Peg, did you have a question? I'm just I just wanted to make a comment um, based on what Bob said about, it, it triggered my thought about the active shooters. Um, and, I, and I think from my perspective, having done anti-violence against women work for 34 years, there's one thing that I've learned, and that is if we don't stop violence at home, it's coming to work, and it's coming to school, and it's coming to everywhere. And the significant majority, and this is researched, even up to last week, the shooting in Texas, 90% of those shooters were men that had beat up women in intimate partner relationships and were never held accountable. And so when we think about, oh, well, you know, you got to protect Peg Brody from her bad work, it's really short-sighted because I might be able to hide out, but he's not. And, you know, we really, I think, tackle this issue, have to take a look at raising our boys and our girls, but mostly our boys, not to, to, to respect women and not to be violent, but no one, no one is talking about these shooters being domestic violence perpetrators. And it's really time, I think, for us to talk about that. And I also think that there's a lot, there was a guy last week that walked, that blew up his, his uh, girlfriend in her workplace. Um, it starts at home, and I think we have to stop it at home. Oh, so that's just that was the bell. There you go. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Donna? Yes, uh, Kim, I agree with you in terms of, and I've seen it, what you're saying is men pulling back and perpetuating the good old boy network because men will not be alone with the woman now, will not take them out to lunch unless they have a witness, etc. It's really changed the environment and we've gone to the other end of it, okay? Which I've seen, and that's really been happening. But the other thing that I want to say is, um, we have a good governor who's very much uh, for women, you know, pushing really for women. One of the things that he proposed is a bill that um, corporations will put more women on their boards. And I'm talking about major corporations. And they will get a tax deduction, et cetera, if they have a certain amount of women, a certain number of women, because then they feel that the whole uh, environment of the company changes with more women in positions of power, okay? That's number one. The other thing that he proposed is legislation about um, sexual assault, okay, as far as sexual assault goes. And in that legislation, there'll be no statute of limitations. If you were assaulted, you could go back 30 years, all right? And it goes on to various things, and one of the things is, is that they feel, he feels that, or his group feels, that women a lot of times can't afford to take the legal suit. So if they lose, not only do they go to jail, but they will pay for the woman's um, uh, legal costs. 
But I have a, a question for you, Bobby, up front. If they get into this litigation, they are talking litigation. You can't just make an accusation now. It will go to court, all right? Can they go back in a woman's sexual history and say, well, she slept with six co-workers? I'm going to defer to our senior litigation case. <laughs> yeah, can they do that? Most of the time they can, yes. And not like a rape case where they can't bring up past things? Um, I have seen that most judges will allow that in a certain okay. in this type of case as, as a relevant evidentiary finding. That has been my experience, and that's only been so. If it's not local. settled and it does go to litigation, they can bring up a woman's sexual history. Yeah, and they like to bring up if she was a flirt, if she told dirty jokes, oh, if she, she yeah, all that stuff. Like they, it gets down and dirty. It really does. I mean, that's I what I've seen thus far. I don't know if that will change going forward, but. That's another reason why it's difficult to go forward with a case like this on a woman's behalf. Okay. Any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, thank you. I'd like to thank this panel. I'd also like to thank the Scranton Cultural Center. Deb uh, P Moran Peterson is in the house, one of our board members, and she is the executive director here. So, Deb, thank you for that. Also, talking about some board, some directors, Bob Offberg and Nada Gilmartin, uh, wonderful directors here at this beautiful house. And thank Debbie in the, uh, as our bartender for helping us. And I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Dr. Ada Rios Rivera, attorney Mary Walsh Dempsey, attorney Bob Offberg, Kim Wylam, Judge Trish Corbett, and Annie Gep. Annie Gephardt for joining us and coming all the way up from Harrisburg. We appreciate it. And thank you so much for your wonderful insight. And Mark McGlory from ECTV, we'd like to give a big shout out to him. Thanks everybody, see you next year.